Robert Turner is Assistant Professor of Clinical Research and Leadership in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at George Washington University. He earned his PhD in sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And he also played football professionally in the United States Football League, the Canadian Football League, and briefly in the NFL. In Not For Long, the life and career of the NFL athlete, Professor Turner draws on his own personal experience as a professional football player and more than 140 interviews with current and formal, former NFL players to report on what life is like for players in the NFL and what life is like for players after they leave the NFL. In chronicling the lives of current and retired players, Professor Turner explores issues as weighty and diverse as the tenuous job security of most NFL players, the inadequate medical benefits that players receive in retirement, the chronic pain that players experience during and after their careers, and the fact that historically over half of NFL players file for bankruptcy at some point after leaving the NFL. Not For Long is an important and timely book, and it raises vital questions that all NFL players, coaches, owners, staff, and fans should take very seriously. Please join me in welcoming Professor Turner. He read that better than I could, so I appreciate that. It is so wonderful to be here and to see so many friendly faces, people from uh, the university, George Washington University, from the church that I belong to locally, the Boys and Girls Club. And um, so many of you say hello to you at many different times, and those who I haven't met before, thank you for coming and being here, and uh, I hope we can have a good time with one another. And I will get right out of the way. Let me just get right out of the gate that I did play in the United States Football League. Some of you may know that league. Some of you may not. Uh, and I had the um, fortune or misfortune of playing for Donald Trump's team in the New Jersey Generals. That is on my CV forever. <laughs> OK, so um, because this is on uh, film and audio, I have to stand behind this thing. So just to make sure that you hear me and it gets gets caught. But um, as we get started, I would like uh, to invite each one of you to um, to kind of take a moment and go with me on a little bit of a journey. Um, and what I'd like you to do is to to really go back to a time in your life. I want you to go back to that time when you were maybe nine or 10 or 11 years old. Uh, a time when you were full of dreams, um, dreams of being a professional athlete or maybe being a professional ballerina, professional dancer, a professional artist, you know, actor. Maybe you dreamt of being like Michael Jackson or Beyonce, right, or a CEO. And, and being that we're in Washington, D.C., maybe some of you dreamt of being a influential politician that was very starry eyed, that wanted to make a difference in the world. Think about that time for a moment. Now, you're about to go and pursue your dream. As you're about to do that, you work very, very hard at your craft. Uh, you go out and you get good grades. You earn a scholarship. And along the way, you get to perform in front of tens of thousands of people, right? Now you're really on your way. People love you. They adore you. They, they keep telling you how much they respect you and they appreciate you uh, and how wonderful you are and how much they adore you because of that special talent that you have, right? And then one day, it actually really does happen. You get a hold of that brass ring. It's in your hands. You get to grab it. It's yours, right? And you bask in the glory of that that brass ring, how, it, how that radiate, it radiates in you, it shines, it glows, you're happy, your family's happy, people are proud of you, you got it, you did it. And then, before you know what happens, it slips right out of your hands, it falls right down, and it's gone forever, you can't get it back up. You had it, and it's gone. It's gone forever. Then what? What do you do then? But the kind of the biggest blow of all is that happens to you when you're 26, 27, 28 years old, and then it's gone. Who are you? What's your identity at that point? Well, that's exactly what happened to me. That's what happens to so many other 
young men and women who dreamt and still dream of being professional athletes. You get it, and then it's gone. Now, what I'd like to do now is ask you to come back with me here today. And I'd like to briefly describe to you um, how I plan on spending the remainder of this time that we have together. First, I'm going to read uh, a brief selection from the book, and then I'll explain how the study came about, how it came into existence, and then how it actually evolved into a manuscript that, that you're here today to hear about. And then next, I will re I'll review several of the major kind of theoretical um, themes that are, that are in the book. And uh, then what I'll do is I'll read another excerpt before I'll turn the microphone over and make sure that we leave enough time for questions. And so one of the things that I really want to emphasize here is, first of all, this is my very first time giving the public speak, uh, talk about the book. Uh, I've done academic talks about it before. But um, with Oxford, we, we came to the conclusion that we thought this would be a really good book to have that's a crossover book, one that could speak to academics, but then also that could reach out to a broader audience. So this is my attempt to share to a broader audience. So let's see how it goes. Okay, so I better pull out my glasses for this. All right, this is from chapter six, which is called, entitled, Masking in the Pain of Masculinity. Just three days before I reported to summer camp with the San Francisco 49ers, I attended Sunday service at my non-denominational evangelical church. There were nearly a thousand members in attendance and 10,000 of the people across the state of New Jersey watched on cable television. The pastor called me, along with Kenny Brelong, a rookie free agent wide receiver for the New York Jets, and Bill Clark, an undrafted rookie defensive tackle for the Miami Dolphins. He motioned us all to come up to the stage so that the congregation could lay hands on us. I felt like everyone was staring as the pastor charged us with being strong role models for Christ. He declared that God had chosen us out of tens of thousands of athletes, and a chorus of hallelujahs rose up from the congregation. He shouted that we had been chosen to evangelize the players in the NFL. Amen, brother, preach it. And by that time, he said I was going to take God's message to the good people of the NFL. Folks in the congregation were jumping around, they were praising God and giving God the glory for the victory. And here I was, 27-year-old, former USFL, CFL athlete, prepared to give it my all for one last shot at the NFL. Going to California wasn't a victory ride for me. It was the fourth quarter with time running out. And all I could think of, what the hell am I going to do if I get cut and all these people and let all these people down? The only thing I could do was put on a brave face and pray that the 49er coaches would see things my way. Odds are always stacked against a rookie free agent trying to break into the NFL roster. At camp, all of my energy was focused on learning the playbook and preparing for every repetition that I could get on the field. I was acutely aware that journeymen like myself were just one play away from a plane ticket home. The coaches needed to see me doing something special every time they reviewed the practice field, making matters worse, for at least for me, that there were four other free agents and one draft choice were battling for one or two open positions in the secondary. The 49ers had won a string of Super Bowls, and it would be a battle for me to remain on the roster once the veteran defensive back Carlton Williamson recovered from his knee injury. And then I got cut. The sting wasn't as painful as I had imagined. What really hit me was when the general manager thanked me for my services and asked, where do you want to go with that plane ticket? I had no answer. My body went numb. My football career was suddenly done. Over all these years, I had been cut four times and bounced back to make another roster, but this time was different. This felt final. It was possible that another team would claim me off of the waiver wires and offer me a contract, but in my heart, I knew it was time to move on. Uh, 
As I sat in the general manager's office, memories of my home church came flooding back, and I was horrified. There was no way I could go back and face everyone after that big scene my pastor had made. Those wonderful people were holding me in their hearts and prayers, lifting me up to the Lord, and I had let them down. What would I say when one of them said, I just saw you on television and you were playing so well. How come you're not on the team anymore? I was five years removed from college at James Madison University, so I knew going back to Virginia didn't really feel like an option. I couldn't face my congregation or my family, so New Jersey was out. I wanted to hide, but instead one night, I had one night to basically absorb the general manager's brisk, firm handshake and let his secretary know where to book my plane ticket. It's one thing to lose your job. Your ego is bruised and you worry about how you'll pay the bills. But in football, so much emphasis is placed on being the toughest, the strongest, the fastest, the best man out there. To lose a football job is to lose that part of your masculine identity. You are still a man, but you're lost in the sports tournament. You are not the man. I decided to rent a car and visit my younger brother, Charles, who was detained at the time at a youth correctional facility. Charles did his best to console me, saying he was proud of his brother, that his brother had played in the NFL. He reminded me that a lot of people never make it that far. No doubt his words were sincere, but the disappointment cut so deep, his words could not soothe my pain. Unsettled, I went to Los Angeles to visit my uncle. In about a week, it dawned on me. I could escape my past in New Jersey, remaining on the West Coast. I could create a new identity and never again try to explain what happened to my NFL career. Thank you. So that's, that's that in chapter three. So there are several themes, there are about eight themes that I want to talk about real quickly that I cover in the book that really kind of frame this whole thing. And I'm going to start by talking about some of you who may know sociology or know Irv Goffman. Uh, he talks about the total institution. And in his classic treatise, Asylum, the essay on social situations of medical patients and other inmates, Goffman emphasizes that all institutions, to some extent, are designed to capture the time and interest of their members. Um, in a total institution, all aspects of life are conducted in the same location, under the same roof, under a single authority, and members' daily activities are carried out in the immediate company of others. All activities are tightly scheduled, and a body of officials impose explicit formal rulings. So Goffman talks about, and examples of total institutions would be mental institutions, prisons, the military. Now, when I was first working through this kind of concept, I would explain to people about the total institution and how I saw how that really impacted athletes. And people would remind me very early, very quickly, well, athletes have options. They don't have to remain in that institution, right? Unlike, say, in prison. So I just kind of ever so slightly turned it little to the left, little to the right. And really what I focus on is calling the NFL or really more broadly, football or the institution or the organization of football, a totalizing institution. And so kind of what I mean by that is the way that I use the term a totalizing institution, it reflects a change in the individual himself, the mental conditioning or an indoctrination process of those athletes aggressively set on and really intent on a career in professional football, it's, in their minds, it's incompatible, incomprehensible to quit. So for them, they have internalized what, an internal, uh, what a total institution is. So if a, a total institution commands control over every aspect of a subject's life, a totalizing institution, it really works as a, uh, it, co um, it coerces individuals into and surrendering their control over to that institution. So I also build on uh, C. Wright Mill's work of the military-industrial complex, and I talk about the sports-industrial complex. And it's 
pretty doggone easy for us to see all around us. I mean, I, I interviewed and talked to a number of families who are committed to having their children play anything from field hockey to ice hockey to basketball to baseball. And very quickly, what you learn is that families are committing anything from $6,000 a year per child to $12,000 per year per child. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is go look on the Internet. And now youth sports today, compared to just a generation ago, is over $5 billion industry. And so uh, we talk about, and, and what I do is I analyze how does this concept of the um, sports industrial complex, how does it really impact the individual themselves as well as uh, all those around him? And so I explore how the, inst the sports industrial complex in its operation as a totalizing institution contributes to the af athletes socialization by presenting the data that I collected from ongoing um, situated micro level interactions with current and former athletes. And so just as you may know, I, my book is an ethnography. And so I did do 140 um, interviews with athletes. But what I did was kind of take it another step further. I obviously was able to draw on my own personal experiences and reflect back on what it is that I had gone through and what I had learned about this whole thing. I was able to have lots of conversation with my parents who raised myself and my brother to go on and play um, major college football and move on and to play professional football and what their experiences were. But I knew that in order for me to understand the transition that these athletes were faced with, particularly today in the sports industrial complex, I had to go out and interview lots of younger people. But what I was also very fortunate in doing is I lived almost four years with current NFL and former NFL athletes. So I really immersed myself like an anthropologist four years into the field in order to um, really basically not only just take their testimonies and what they said, but try to match up the differences and understand those social processes of how they lived, how they made sense of the world, and what were the contradictions and what were the consistencies in the way that they lived and experienced the world. And that's what I tried to capture in the book. Um, I also draw from uh, the work of Michel Foucault and Louis Raquant, who talk about the sociology of the body. And uh, Michael, uh, Michel Foucault, he contends that the body is the surface on which the social is actually inscribed. And uh, likewise, his student, Louis Requant, he reminds us that a sociological investigation of the body is well situated to uncover the varied ways in which specific social worlds invest and shape and deploy on the body. And so that's what I was really trying to understand. And, and that took me to the areas where we're looking at in, you know, people who are injured and how they dealt with those as well, how they talked about it, how they experienced it, how their families interacted on that. What could we learn about our social values, both for kids as well as for adults um, in, the, in football? The next theme that I really drew on was probably my most difficult and the, the theme that I, I really wanted to fight against the most, but I was forced to because I had a great mentor. And that's Carol Stacks, who wrote the book, All Our Ken. Um, what she told me, she said, you know, you're writing about football players. There's two things you got to write about. You got to write about black men, which I did. And she said, you got to write about masculinity. But I didn't want to do masculinity. For one, I didn't want to do the examination internally. But two, I did not want to do something that would somehow or another offend the athletes. Because one of the most important parts of writing this book was to give the athletes their own voice. And hopefully that could rise out and people could hear that. And so I didn't want athletes to feel as though they were somehow or another being judged in the way that they, they live life. But... Um, with that being said, Carol said, you got to get into it. So what I did was I really drew off of the work of uh, Michael Mesner and Michael Kimmel. And um, they have documented over and over again the rewards of masculinity, how those rewards inspire boys and young men to make tremendous sacrifices in the name of sports. And so what I did is I just kind of I looked to investigate how these rewards follow their keen kind of focus on the consequences of masculinity with this group that I was looking at, uh, including men's self-censorship and the loss of voice in larger social uh, conversations and their common unwillingness to report their own vulnerabilities or the hardships that they have.
you know, it's not something you hear about in the locker room and it is certainly not something that you hear uh, from them when they get around and they talk about the good old days. But one on one, some people were willing to really share some of the things that they were going through. And it really captured me. So another thing that I uh, talk about in the book that kind of frames the overall thing in the book is I draw from um, from Rosenbaum, who talks about the corporate tournament uh, mobility model. And so I look at sports really in this organizational field. And, and in the book, you'll see, I don't look, I don't think you can understand why people have a problem in a certain part of their life in the later part of their lives after they've transitioned out until you understand kind of the whole life history that they had. And so part of that is to recognize that these athletes are in a sports tournament from day one, whether they recognize it or not. You love the game, you're playing the game, you just want to compete, but there is a tournament that you're playing. And so what I do is this concept that I, I kind of build on is as it's applied, an athlete's career is a series of competitions from junior football, uh, from junior football leagues all the way from junior to high school to college and to the pros. And so there are winners and losers that are separated at each point along the way. And so the winners, they move on and compete at a higher level in the tournament, but they're never assured that even once they've just won on one level, that they'll be able to keep on moving beyond any given level in the next competition. Losers often are just relegated to lower level contests or wholly denied the opportunity to compete any further. And so um, when any given contest ends, the victor must turn and start preparing immediately for the next competition. And you even see that in the pros every day because there's no guaranteed contract. So whatever you do today, if you're not performing at the level they need you to, you could be gone tomorrow. And so I focus on kind of this, this hierarchy in the book where I say that what we have is we have our stars, we have our journeymen, and then we have our dedicated sports enthusiasts. And so all of us as little kids, we all jump into this sports tournament because we love the game. Right. So we all have these starry eyed notions as, you know, um, little kids. We just en enthusiastic about it. But very simply, very, very quickly, because some people may not be tall enough or strong enough or, you know, to this or not enough that uh, shifting starts to happen very quickly. And so when you're a star like I was in junior football and then in high school football, then all of a sudden you get to college and where you're recruited or if you're recruited or whether you play right away or whether you start, you get injured and you never do get on the field there's a hierarchy very very quickly and so it became quick after I got out of college that I was going to be a journeyman athlete and so it took a little while for me to even understand what that meant and what my role was and how I was going to be able to find my way within that um, and so another kind of really really kind of central idea to this what we're talking about here is um, what I looked at is athlete the athletic role and the unidimensional athlete so my good friend and scholar, um, Leah Kelia Jones, she observed in her work with athletes at a Division I football program that the athletic role may occupy such a central role in one's self-conception that it dominates the ego identity. And similarly, sports sociologists Taylor and Ogilvy and others suggest that the most influential so, uh, psychological issue that influences adaptation to the career transition is the degree to which athletes define their self-worth in terms of their participation and achievement in sports. And so these scholars, they kind of all, if you think about it, they all come together with this term, it's called the unidimensional athlete that is disproportionately invested in their sports participation. They often have fewer fulfilling or meaningful out activities outside of their sports. And it's so interesting because you can even talk to athletes and you can see things that they're doing. And I can see where they are saying that they are not a unidimensional athlete. And, and it was the same exactly thing with me. But at the core of it, if that thing gets taken away, there's always that question of who am I now? And so I combine that with what's called the role exit theory, which was by um, sociologist Roel Eba, who at one point was a nun, and then she transitioned out of that role to become a university professor. And her, and Eba, she argues that the role exit is so sociologically and psychologically intriguing since it implies that the interaction is based not only on current 
definitions, but more importantly, on the past identities that somehow linger on the de defined and define how people see and present themselves uh, in their present identities. So for Rose Ebal, role exit is the process of disengagement from a role that is central to one's self-identity and the reestablishment of an identity and a new role that takes into account one's X role. And this is very important, so I want you to hold on to that. But an overlapping development, uh, developed athletic identity can leave athletes ill-prepared for post-sports career. And there's a uh, strongly associated football, uh, um, the strongly associated football self-identity reinforces uh, reinforced through close personal ties and teammates can lead to a variety of developmental, psychological, and social issues that may exacerbate difficulties during the uh, forced role exit from the league. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that during an unwelcome or unforced retirement, I mean forced retirement or unwelcome retirement, the status in, enjoyed by an NFL athlete will come, uh, will compete with his self-identity for temporal and psychological resources that can result in role conflict. And so what, what Ebal was doing is she was looking at people who voluntarily exited from one role and then worked through that process to, ex to adopt a new role. And one of the things that I have found and that I argue in this book and we, the questions that I raise is what happens when you're forced to uh, respond to an involuntary exit or when the role, the primary roles link so closely with the identity that's your master status and that's the one that you want so closely and you don't want to let go of it, what happens out of no control of your own, you're forced to give that away. And that is probably more than the money, more than the social status, more than anything else. That's the thing that's so difficult for many of these men to deal with as they transition out of the sport. And then so very lastly, kind of in a nod to uh, my dissertation advisor, um, Professor Stanley Aronowitz, as well as um, Karl Marx, what I do is I kind of look at analysis of the labor um, relationships in the NFL. And so what I say is, what I argue is that NFL owners, they have successfully developed a mode of production that determines and defines their social relationships with athletes. An NFL athlete's social status and the relationship with management, coaches, and sports agents, and the players' union is largely dictated by his position in the labor uh, process. And so as Marx put it, uh, once the instrument of labor begins uh, to employ workers, a, a fact that arises out of the social relationship, the work process is fixed in the hand of management. And although NFL athletes enter into a contractual arrangement to receive wages in exchange for their athletic performance, star players and high draft choices, they behave most often, I argue in the book, like petty bourgeoisie um, to, at the expense of the proletariat journeyman. So with that being said, I just want to read uh, one more little part of a chapter and then a little vignette from the preference, and then I'm going to open it up. So this is in chapter three, The Field of Goals and Dreams. You want to go? Normally, I'm unscathed when I hear a threat like that. I played football for 16 years. I'm confident in my ability to man up. But the aggressive tone was out of character in, on the sidelines of Test Sports NFL Combine training camp for children. I turned to face my challenger. He was tall, he was solid, and based on his muscular form, I guess he was a former pro ball player. If that's what you want to do, I said, I told him I played pro ball too, and that I can handle myself if we want to go. He said, he said to me, I see you're talking to one of my guys. He kind of, real gruff. It occurred to me at that point that I was infringing on his territory by giving pointers to Nas, who I thought needed to loosen up his football stance. He was a little too tight in the hips. In the never-ending sports tournament, each interaction is a contest. It doesn't matter how many contests you win, back and down is not an option. Even if you're no longer playing the game, it's instinctual. The idea that the next contest is only around the corner has been drilled into you. By interacting with this man's pupil, I was a threat, 
and he couldn't just let that be. I'm writing a book about the struggles players have after they leave the game. I said, I told him, I explained that I was in graduate school studying for my PhD in sociology. The deep lines in his face then softened. Then you're gonna wanna hear me talk, brother. My name is Odessa, Odessa Turner, but people call me OD. I was initially drawn to Odessa because of his no-nonsense approach to coaching. I saw him dress down Will Hill, the All-American high school safety from North uh, New Jersey, uh, as he was preparing for his first season at the University of Florida on a football scholarship. This was long before uh, Will the Thrill Hill signed a free agent contract to play for the New York Giants and was released and then picked up on waivers by the Baltimore Ravens. Will let a receiver fake him out during a one-on-one -on -one drill, and O.D. read him the riot act. O.D. barked at this five-star athlete like a Marine drill instructor dressing down a private at basic training. He told Hill, those Florida boys, they're going to eat you alive if you plan on playing like that down there. O.D. is a study of contrast. He uh, struggles to understand families who pay all that money to give their children a private athletic coaching sessions and send them to skilled based development camps. But O.D. himself reaps the benefits in the form of paychecks and coaching experience of those indulgences. He disapproves of the fact that guys like Test co-owner Brian Martin, who has zero NFL experience, were making so much money off of what O.D. and other African-American former NFL players did for those kids. But O.D. hasn't figured out how to turn his coaching skills and his football experiences into a lucrative business of his own. Even though he couldn't give up, he couldn't give a specific example, O.D. resents the idea of entrepreneurs such as Brian Martin taking care of white former NFL players while the African-American guys got nothing but scraps. African-American former players made these sports training businesses commercially viable, but O.D. assessed that they reaped, the damn, they reaped damn little of the financial rewards. As I listened to O.D.'s story, I realized that I had never heard a mention that he took a money management class in college. O.D. never said anything about what his parents had taught him about calculating interest, making solid real estate investments, deciphering the stock market, or any of that. His parents, who raised him right, couldn't have known what struggles he would eventually face as a professional football player, not in making money, but in keeping it. His parents couldn't teach him what they didn't know. They couldn't prepare him for success in a college classroom because they had no institutional knowledge of college. OD's indifference to his education could have been a reflection of his parents' attitudes, or perhaps it was a result of larger common attitudes reflected in the lower uh, per pupil spending ratios common among predominantly poor and black communities. Maybe it's the tacit understanding that a career in football would give him much more, uh, would give much more to the player and his family than an education ever could. Sociologist Harry Edwards asserts that permission, that this permission to forego all else um, in the interest of succeeding in a sport pursuit disproportionately damages the social and financial resilience of African-American athletes and robs their communities of young African-American men who might otherwise have become doctors, lawyers, accountants, or even teachers. And so now I just want to read just a small vignette from the preface that really builds on and tells you from Harry Edwards where my work fits in. Um, an important ap academic goal of my research is to reintroduce sports as a primary location for the critical examination of society. Since 1990s, it has been pushed to the fringes of sociology. Of the nearly 55 sections within the uh, American Sociological Association, not one concentrates on sports as a subfield. Now, Dr. Harry Edwards' assessment is an excellent summation of my own perspective. And he, I quote here, Americans traditional regulation of sports to the toy department of human affairs neglects both its significance as, as an institution and the seriousness of its impact on social relations and development. 
As, a, as scholars and lay readers alike consider the empirical evidence presented in this book, I hope they will agree that sports can serve as a microcosm of the larger society. By approaching sports as a site for social interaction, I believe anyone can explore the racial and gender inequality, the roles and functions of institutions and organizations in individuals' lives, health and, uh, and, and injury, along with aging and people's experiences of work and labor. Through the prism of sports alone and together, these topics can help any interested person gain a deeper understanding of our country and our world. And I think a great example of that was just taking place out in the media and kind of played out in the media and through Twitter just this last couple of days in the interactions between the president number 45 and um, his comments about the NFL, his comments about LeBron James. We can see very well how these social interactions really form our world today. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I have two quick questions. One is, um, did I understand at the beginning that you said that about 50% of NFL players end up declaring bankruptcy within a few years of retirement? Was that correct? It is correct, although I would say I, I have a little skepticism about those statistics, but by and large, athletes do have a real big problem. Um, those statistics, were they were delivered through Sports Illustrated in an article, and Sports Illustrated never gave reference to the actual research that provided that. And they also gave this kind of real kind of nebulous um, statement and said that these athletes were uh, broke, uh, and or divorced, and that, that led to them being broke. But the point is, is that there's serious financial problems when they get done. So given that, uh, would you say that your experience as a football player all those years doing a cost-benefit analysis, analysis <laughs> was it worth it for you personally? And then do the players that you interviewed for this book, did you get into the topic of chronic brain um, injury and are the young players aware of it and are they how do they feel about it in terms of long-term consequences well thank you for both of those questions I was wondering how long it would take for the concussion thing to come um, well for let me say first um, how did I personally benefit from football? Well, I certainly wouldn't be standing here uh, today had it not been for football in multiple ways. I probably, maybe I would have gone to college, but more than likely I probably would have followed my dad's footsteps and went into the Marines. So that was that was probably the trajectory that was gonna go. But because of football, I was able to get a scholarship to for undergraduate and that paid for all of my education there. I was able to pursue a master's degree and a PhD, all because of football. It opened the doors and, and it allowed me to explore things that I would have never thought to explore before. So on a personal level, I've benefited tremendously. And I've seen lots of other people benefit tremendously from that. And the question about CTE and the concussions, I, you know, it's a big question, first of all, but yes, I, I have talked to athletes about that. And I've asked them, particularly I had a conversation with a young man who is a, um, a scholar, uh, um, he's a, he basically received an academic scholar and walked on to the football program in, at the University of North Carolina, African American young man. And I asked him, I said, listen, you, he was, um, he went to uh, international baccalaureate program, he was a valedictorian, the world is his oyster. And I said to him, why, why do you play? Why would you continue to play if in fact this is out there? And he said to me, essentially, if we boiled it down, he said, you know what? Football, there's nothing like it. He goes, playing with my friends. He goes, but truly, it's kind of about the masculinity. It's kind of about, I get to really be the man. I get to be a man. I get to be around other guys. And is, there's nothing else that provides that same thing for me. And I realize that, you know, I'm going to go on and I'm going to do great things. But boy, I just love that game because of what it does. And he said it. And he said something I thought was so striking. He said to me, if you take away football, there's going to be a lot of African-American men. That there's a huge void and, it's, and we don't know what's going to fill it. And I thought that that was pretty profound. That's something that I want to continue to explore in my work. Hey, how are you? Dr. Good to Turner, see you. Mm -hmm. uh, should children under the age of 14 play tackle football? Now, why you want to go there? We, 
we were on a, he hosted a panel at George Washington University and we talked about this very thing. I feel this way. First of all, I have no problem with children under 14 playing, but I will say this. I don't think that there is any valid reason to keep them out, but I also don't, I think that there's lots of good reasons if parents want to exercise their own independent choice to keep their children out under 14. Absolutely, that's fine. I think, you know, the arguments that people say, well, you know, you learn the skills that you need at the younger stage in order to be successful and protect yourself on the older level. I don't think that that argument per se is a valid argument that holds up on its own because I think that there's plenty of skills that you can teach them in flag football or any other thing um, in order for them to play at a, at a greater age. But I also don't think that the rate of concussions by any means puts those kids at any greater um, risk because I think one of the biggest problems that we have is our kids aren't playing enough athletics anyway. We need to get them out playing more, right? And so if we teach them and we put them in a very safe environment, I don't have a problem with them at all playing uh, on youth football. Okay. Thank you. I always have to, um, first let me thank you for what you had to say. I find it quite interesting. Uh, I'm not from the United States. I'm from the Caribbean. So cricket and, you know, soccer. Which country? Uh, a small island, St. Martin. I was born in Rubber, grew up in St. Okay. Martin, French Dutch Island. Okay. But I was very um, taken by the fact, uh, and I must say that uh, I had a son who played very well. And if he was a little, his mom is, is, is small. If he was a little taller, uh, I think we would end up fighting because I did not want him to play football at all. I, I really don't see much in the sport. I mean, um, but I have a problem with that. I like boxing. <laughs> yeah. So you, you do see. Although, although, I don't know how we're going to defend the no, indefensible. No, no, just a minute. Oh, I, oh, just a minute. <laughs> I believe, I believe, yes, yes. I'll, I'll make the argument that yes. um, if I had a son who could box and in, in, in play football, um, and he was a really good boxer, I would tell him be a boxer instead of a football player. I think the damage in football is simply too long. But the same thing in soccer. We know from now, uh, when I was in the Netherlands, uh, where I studied, butting the ball, right? Nobody talked about it. Now there's a lot of research coming out, right? That you know, continually booting that football, especially in, in the winter when the ball is hard as a rock, that is, it's catastrophic for your brain and, and stuff like that. So, you know, all of these very high level intense sports clearly have consequences for people. But the issue what I want to talk about is um, another issue and a kind of political issue. Because I always see, from the moment I came here, and I haven't seen much, but what I've seen of it, of, of, of American NFL football, uh, and being from the Caribbean, obviously, uh, it's really American imperialism playing out on the field. It's manifest destiny playing out on the field again and again, right? I'll kill you or you'll kill me for territory, right? And this territory, to gain this territory, is basically above everything else. You know, your 10 yards and stuff like that. And then throwing the ball, you can have a, a metaphor for bombing. And I mean, there's all type of different metaphors you can, you yes. can think about it. So what I would like to know is, has anybody thought, uh, Talked about that? Has anybody pointed that out? Uh, and also the issue of the violence of football, right? How does that violence uh, playing out in a society that, you know, neoliberal society breaking down with all type of relationships, atomizing, etc. I mean, you're a sociologist, atomizing, you know, highly competitive in individualism. How do you see this NFL football heightening those aspects of society or um, metastasizing? those competitive aspects of society more and more uh, going forward. So I'd like to know how you uh, have thought about him or other people have thought about this. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. And thank you for that question. Dr. Zimbrana, the first thing that comes to mind is we should invite him to campus. We can have a very long and engaged conversation on that. Because um, those are very good questions. Um, and it brings to mind the work of France Fanon um, right up front. And so I think we see that playing out in a lot of different ways. One, um, the one thing that, I, that strikes me kind of uh, in the question that you're asking, um, it plays out so many different ways, but it's this whole notion, this whole idea in American football, unlike other sports, I mean, you see it bleeding into other sports now, but nothing like football, is this whole idea of patriotism. I mean, I went to a game, um, about four or five years ago at the, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Green Bay Packers. And I had never seen this. This was when they were starting. They, they had a big, huge American flag cut out in the, in the shape of the United States of America. And they unfolded it um, and unfurled it through the whole football 
you know, field. It covered almost the whole football field. And so right up front, the NFL recognized and as a way to make money that they were going to, in fact, be the most patriotic, you know, league in the country. They, that, that, that patriotism and football was just like baseball, apple pie and Chevrolet. You couldn't pull them apart. And I think in some respects, where we see people all over this Kaepernick idea, these, and they're having these problems, because you remember, Kaepernick never took the need to talk about, he never criticized America being unpatriotic. He was talking about problems that were happening in the streets that we weren't talking about and that needed to be addressed. But very quickly, one of the reasons you could can, you can turn the narrative so quickly, particularly about the NFL, is because every game you go to, every time you watch television, all the commercials, it's all about about Americana, right? So it fits very much within what you're talking about. Um, and then we also, I think the other thing that we have to really consider when we talk about this is about in, in the 80s, we started to see a traumatic, you know, kind of paradigm shift. The, the bodies went from in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s to being predominantly white, overwhelmingly white. Then all of a sudden the NFL became overwhelmingly black, right? And so it's um, the football became pretty doggone brutal during that time as well. Um, and so I think that those things, ha they play a role in all of this. The controlling, and I, I talk about this a little bit in the book, the controlling of the black body and what that means in terms of um, out in, in, in the way that we perceive things in public. But your question has so many different tentacles to it that I couldn't obviously unpack it all right here. But I do think, you know, you're really driving right down the middle of some important lanes when it comes to this particular game. Um, my name is Keith Colbert. Um, I can relate to everything you said. Um, I got drafted in 86 to play basketball. And, you know, I was at the lower hierarchy of, of the athletes. I played with Del Curry at Virginia Tech. So the question um, I have is how hard was it with the masculinity of, you know, the, the football to, to get some of the stories from them, to correct stories, the truth, you know, from some of the athletes to, to do research on Hmm. So about masculinity or just about all different aspects? Yes, yes. Well, so so again, I what, it took four years. Right. So I was out in the field. I knew first of all, I knew what to look for. And that was so my learning curve was was shortened that way. I knew kind of I understood kind of the whole trajectory that athletes had to go through. But um, I, I was trained by some really, really wonderful um, sociologists and really smart people that said, hey, just because people say certain things, you have to look for the inconsistencies. What is the difference? What's their real lived experiences? And that's what I really wanted to know. So I talked to some young men who was at the, happened to be at the time, they were all trying to go into the NFL, they're going to the NFL combine. and. Um, and they had come from a, the University of Minnesota where, you know, a, while they were playing, several of the guys on their football team had gotten arrested and indicted for rape of women, right, uh, on campus. And so we started having conversations about that. How does that happen? Why does that still happen? Why is that going on? Guys know um, how much it would cost them if they do stuff like that, but why are they still doing this? And then the conversation led to, which I, you know, it was kind of interesting. So I said, how come when we watch television, especially generations ago, you know, when it comes to uh, particularly African-American men, what, one thing you can't do is talk about their mama, right? As you know, they see them on television all the time. Thanks, mom. Hi, mom. How's that all going? And I said, but if that's the case, if that's what we do, then why do we treat women the way that we do, especially the athletes? And they had no answer for that. They were like, that's a really good question. So the answer to your question is that what I had to do is, one, I had to look around the edges, and two, I had to really spend time with them, and I had to um, see the difference between what they were saying and what they were doing. And one of the things I did find, there's some tremendous men who are really great fathers. There are other guys, and I really, what I attribute it to is this kind of whole notion of masculinity. There's a lot of guys that don't, because they're incapable of talking about their own vulnerabilities, they mask it with going out with a whole bunch of women, doing drugs and all of these other things. But by and large, I would say the ones who stay in the league and that are successful over time, they recognize that it's time to put those toys away real early. And they, I did see some great family men who were really worried about and thought about how their behavior 
was really um, how their daughters would see those things happen. So that's how I saw some of that. And, stuff. and also, I think um, someone said about the 50 percent of you know being um, broke. I know now that the the NBA and the NFL have counselors for them. You know, before you sign that contract, you are there with um, everything is there for your counselor, uh, a financial advisor. Everything is there. Like years ago, it, you know, wasn't any of that. So you have there. It, you know, it's up to you, you know, to use that service. So. Well, I'll just speak to that one quick. So uh, one of the athletes in the book um, was uh, Vaughn Bryant, who played for Stanford from inner city Detroit, won a scholarship, brilliant guy, got drafted in the fourth round, got kicked around in the NFL for a little while, and then he played, um, rather he was in the front office for the um, NFL for a couple years, and he sh shared with me years, this was when I first started the study back in um, 2006 or so, he told me at the time, which I had no idea, but every NFL athlete, as far back as that point, had the opportunity to attend summer classes uh, and get a cert certificate from Harvard. Harvard Business School or from the University of Pennsylvania Business School. But what Vaughn told me was he said that the NFL owners knew that at maximum only 20 percent of the guys were going to uh, actually sign up for that. And um, and the the rest of it, we're, we're never going to do that. And so he said, so it is a real resources. There are lots of resources out there. But I wanted to understand why 80 percent wouldn't do that. And one of the answers that I really came across um, through my research and through spending time in the classroom is that one of the problems that college has, and we haven't talked about college at all, but one of the problems that colleges have is that they make academic exceptions for superior, what they consider to be superior athletes who really, in many instances, don't have the ability to kind of perform on that college level. And so what they wind up doing is they wind up checking out in school or, or what many people told me is C's get degrees. And sometimes the universities would carry them along to that. So those are the same guys that signed a couple million dollar contract. There's no way they're going to Harvard Business School to do something because they don't want to, they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to, you know, have that be seen out to them. So the, the problem just just like education on so many different levels is systemic that has to be you know looked at much earlier before they ever get into the NFL. Right, Dr. Turner. Thank Good you. to see you. Thanks for a wonderful presentation and a really important book. I guess my question is a follow-up to that since sports in general is a vehicle for upward mobility for many um, African Americans and Latinos um, Absolutely. in the field. What types of programs, as the gentleman just raised, in terms of financial literacy, in terms of health literacy, and what happens when you get injured and medical care? I think you mentioned there are no benefits afterwards. For many um, of them, many, yes. And education. I mean, these are areas where they can really improve themselves and their families as they move forward. So what are the types of investments and efforts that they make? And you've mentioned some. Um, and does this appear in your book or is that the next book? <laughs> well, there are some of the, first of all, thank you for that question. That's a wonderful question. And there are some things that I do cover in the book. But if it were me, and we know that, you know, there's no perfect solution and no perfect world. But if it were for me, I'd start at the root of it and I'd blow the whole thing up. For, for me, the real problem in, in, in many respects well, it starts before college, but the problem is, is that college universities, I feel that they should not be in the business of um, the business of sports because what they're doing is for the bigger schools, they're trying to make money. And I think that that ultimately is a conflict uh, um, when it comes to educating young people. Now, if if some of the athletes get educated, great. But if they don't, as long as they keep them eligible, that's what really counts as far as many of the Division One programs. The other thing that I think I really believe that what colleges, if, if they're if they really want to make sure that their kids are very equipped, that they go out and recruit. And I can only speak to football because that's where I spent my time. But we know that in many places, like the state of North Carolina, where I spent a lot of my time, when they recruit in, you know, inside the state, 
Many, many, many of those athletes come from the same programs. They, the coaches, it's a board. They have them up on the board. They know where these kids come from. They, that, that's their talent pool. They go year after year after year and draw from those talent pools. And some of those schools, many of those schools have deficiencies overall for all the students in those schools. So when you're pulling from them, that, that's the field that you're pulling from. They're, you're asking them to, to really, it's a heavy lift for those kids to be um, financially literate and fit and educationally to be able to perform on the level that will really help them. So what I would love to see is I'd love to see universities in the state come together, particularly the ones that spend, that have these big, huge budgets for athletics, spend some of those resources in the school, in the communities that with kids when they're eight in the eighth grade in the ninth grade when they're young and you help them understand I mean I just was listening probably some of you have saw there was a program where we were talking about the lemonade com competition that was in in the Midwest somewhere and one of the entrepreneurs was you teaching really young kids in fifth grade about entrepreneurial skills right so, and selling lemonade we should be doing those kinds of things with these young men because if they're we know they're going to school they may never go to pros but we know that they're going to these colleges to play football we know know that that's going to happen. So you can't just expect that what you're going to do today, and I hear it from academic advisors all the time, our job once we get them here is to support them so that they can succeed at least on the college level. But they're so far behind. I know of situations where there were guys who still in, in 2000 and 13, 2011, they, they read on the, on something like sixth, seventh grade level, but they were going through classes. So if that's the case and that's where they are, we need remediation way much earlier because we know where they're coming from. It's no surprise what schools they come from. Every year after every year after every year in my home state of New Jersey, we know where these kids are getting scholarships from. So if they're cut, do they get any services? No. Nothing. No, if, especially if you... the You... You have to play in the NFL. It, NFL, generally, there are some exceptions where some people have, they don't get, have guaranteed contracts, but they get signing bonuses. And so this is where I was saying that there's a real hierarchy. The higher you, really what I argue in the book is where you enter into the league is what, that's, that's the biggest factor of what, how your life is going to be when you get out of the league. So if you get in first or second round and you sign a multi-million dollar contract, you have a much better opportunity to stay a little bit longer. So even if you lose all the money that you earn during your career, you at least now have retirement benefits, which consist of some, um, you know, health insurance, but then also you have a pension. But you got to be in the league at least four years. And the average career length is 3.3 seasons. So it's no coincidence that the, the, the owners of the league and the Players Association colluded together to make sure that the vast majority of people won't receive those benefits. Yes. You just mentioned that this was your first public presentation. I come here all the time and see super experts on everything, and you're just about the best of all presentations <laughs> and give the most information. That's Thank useful. you. And answers, you. you know, really a lot of people's curiosities. So that, and I was just curious, I was wondering, you know, your style, your presentation, phenomenal. And then you mentioned the Marine Corps. I was just wondering, what did your dad do in the Marine Corps? Uh, my dad was on communications, and he uh -huh. was a staff sergeant in the Marines. Well, and you, uh, that's that's number one. Well, your, dad, we got, your dad was great for you. Mom and dad, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. <laughs> How are you doing, Robert? Good, Davis. Good to see you. So I, I want to go back to some of the questions about like identity and masculinity that you brought up. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm 29 years old. Um, just not that much older than you were when you were cut and a lot of sounds like a lot of other people in similar situations and I was thinking while I was listening to you talk that you know if I had to totally change my career at 29 if I lost my job I'd be worried about paying the bills I'd be worried about finding a new job but I don't think it cut me to the core of my identity I just don't identify with my job that much um, which is obviously very different so I was wondering if you could talk real briefly because I know about done here about what makes it so critical to that sense of identity or masculinity to play in the NFL or other professional sports I assume well thank you again for that question I can I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to speak from my own personal experience but then maybe try to draw from some other guys as well but my experience I grew up in 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 those of y'all who know me I grew up in inner city North New Jersey at a time where um, shortly after the riots and everything, my parents really cared to get me 
and my family um, in a situation where we had a better education, it was safety, a better life. They were really trying to make a better life for us. So what they did was they moved from Newark out to the suburbs. And um, during a time where, you know, there was desegregation, you know, taking place and it was a, a working class, predominantly, uh, overwhelmingly white community. And myself and many of my um, other young men like myself, we, we caught hell, to be quite honest with you. I mean, when I was in um, elementary, junior high school, they uh, put me in a remedial reading uh, remedial education classes and I couldn't understand why but when I looked around it was only people that looked just like me uh, black and brown folks I didn't understand what was going on so very quickly I, I tried out for the baseball team one year and um, it was Little League and I didn't make it so what my dad did is he took all the guy, kids who were just like me but put us on a recreational team and we killed everybody so they changed the rules the next year and they want us on all of their teams right so what was pretty easy it was obvious to me that I was the one area they wouldn't let me complete and compete any place else. But the one area that I knew that I was superior to everybody else and that everybody loved me was to play sports. Right. So I knew that my social I got social status. I got social ex, um, acceptance. I got everything. So football, all of a sudden, and it just so happened, I mean, I played every sport. I was really good at them. But my love was football. One of the reasons probably because I was because I love to hit people, right? And I, and I probably needed to hit somebody. <laughs> and so it was good. As they say, it's better to be a hammer than a nail. So um, I liked hammering on people. Uh, but so, so in my mind, it wasn't until I went to sociology years later that I started to reflect and look back and realize that, you know, my social situation, my status, my all of these experiences really kind of helped shape and form me so that way I presented myself to the world as a football player. That was gave me sense of purpose and, and meaning, right? So it was natural that I, I relished that. It was easy for me to step into that role and to assume that response, that identity, because I got a lot of benefits from it. So once it was done, I really had a hard time. Right. And I knew I, I knew from my perspective. Yeah, I graduated from college and I did pretty I did OK. I mean, I did a little better than C's, <laughs> but um, I knew I had something to fall back on. But I looked around and saw some other guys that were on my team and I was like, man, they're going to have some real trouble because that's what they had. Right. And so they were everybody was trying to leverage everything that you had. But eventually, you know, no, it never feels good when someone forces you out. It's one thing when you say, all right, it's about time. Or, and this is where you hear a lot. People say, well, I stopped playing because I, I had a bum knee. Well, that, that's easy, right? That, that explains why you couldn't do. But to man up and say, yeah, well, you know what? It was my time was done. I just wasn't good enough anymore. That's really hard. Nobody says that, but it's really hard. But at least through the book for me personally, it took a lot of self-reflection and self-examination before I could even rewrite that chapter about the masculinity because I wasn't ready to face up to it, but thank God for uh, Carol Stack, she, she made me look at it. So thank you very much. Thank you.